II brought technological warfare to full flower. The scientist and the engineer became as important as the general or the admiral. We came to know the soldier, sailor, marine or airman, not just as a fighting man, but as a specialist and technician. The atomic bomb, radar, guided missiles, proved in military terms the life or death value of scientific study and engineering experimentation. Today, our military research and development are working on the maximum scale permitted by peacetime budget limitations. Joint Army, Navy, and Air Force research projects are common. In a world faced with the threat of sudden war that may destroy whole continents, we want to enforce the peace by making it clear to a potential aggressor that such a war would result in swift and terrible retaliation. We are voicing this warning not only by building a strong and alert military establishment, but also by underwriting an unparalleled program of scientific and technical study and experiment. Its purpose is to ensure a clear and unapproachable superiority in the techniques and weapons whereby today's wars are won. The federal government has made research and development a national effort coordinating the armed forces, industry, and our universities in more than 10,000 different projects. These projects are not all directly concerned with creating military weapons. It is the job of research to uncover the facts of nature, regardless of their practical application. For instance, it was Einstein's theory of relativity that led eventually to the creation of the atom bomb. Just as it was the early discoveries by Hertz and Tesla of radio echoes that evolved into wartime radar. It is the task of development to take the facts uncovered by research scientists and convert them into things, into inventions, devices, techniques that will assure us technological supremacy in peace and war. Today, the concept of global war dominates the military thinking of the great nations. Global warfare means fighting in every kind of climate. on every kind of terrain. Fighting carried on by highly trained, self-sufficient forces, widely dispersed and swiftly maneuvered. An ability to bring overwhelming force immediately to bear on any portion of the globe is as much a deterrent to would-be aggressors as super weapons like the atom bomb or biological warfare. Research and development, therefore, must give much of its attention to improving those thousand and one items of arms and equipment that will enable widely scattered troops deployed under extreme conditions of weather and environment to operate with more firepower and mobility than ever before. Conventional weapons are being given unconventional firepower. In the field of naval guns, the trend is toward increased firepower by making loading completely automatic from the ship's magazine to the gun breech. Guided missiles are being developed, which may be launched from aircraft, surface vessels, or submarines, and which direct themselves to the target through built-in intelligence. Equal progress is being made in evolving self-guiding torpedoes which will steer themselves to the target when launched from ships, planes, or submarines. The subsurface warship has been given more speed, ruggedness, and endurance since the end of the war. Utilizing a breather device known as the snorkel, it can navigate underwater for prolonged periods of time. Concurrent with underwater developments are those in the anti-submarine warfare field. Improved launchers provide more accurate firing of depth missiles.
and the technique of planting mines from the air is steadily being improved. The deadliness of many weapons has been enormously increased by the wider use of the uncanny DT fuse, which detonates its load of explosive on the target or at a predetermined distance above it. Automatic fire is graduated from small arms into the big league. Besides rockets, Ordnance has created fully automatic cannon and is now striving to perfect power-operated loading of tank guns. Progressive engine design has created a much lighter power plant, as in the General Patton tank. Although it generates 800 horsepower, this air-cooled engine takes up less space than the 500 horsepower liquid-cooled engine of the General Pershing tank. Less weight means greater maneuverability, as well as higher speeds and longer operating ranges. A Sherman tank is easily outraced by the new Patton. Equipment as well as weapons and engines has been radically affected by this trend toward the smaller and lighter. Engineer pontons, bridges, and assault boats are being constructed of aluminum for easy portability. Lightweight plastic boats have been developed, which possess the strength and seaworthiness of conventional craft, yet may be mass-produced at far less cost than metal or wood boats. Joint Army and Navy development has produced a walking barge capable of operating in water and swamps or over mud flats. With this vehicle, carrying service is available from ship side to any point inland. Experiments are also being conducted in the surface solidification of beachheads. This process will make it possible for trucks to operate down to the water's edge and speed up the transfer of supplies inland. Ponderous communications equipment is being shrunk in size and weight. In this telephone exchange, the largest component weighs 800 pounds. It is down to 200 in this experimental model, which Signal Corps research engineers are developing as a possible replacement. The bulky walkie-talkie may no longer be giving the soldier an aching back. In the current model, it is trimmed down about 13 pounds. Slimmer and more compact in the lightweight version, it is also more efficient. Even the old handy talkie has lost weight. In the new streamlined version, which operates on FM. The old model, which was the last word in radio fashion in World War II, has been given a new look, which is not only prettier, but more comfortable. More powerful, too, since it has 14 tubes instead of five. Lighter, sturdier materials have led to a brand new technique of aerial laying of communication wires. This will save considerable time by hurdling terrain obstacles. The concept of global warfare means that the highways of the air will be the chief routes of attack and movement of troops and supplies. Our aerial vehicles, therefore, have undergone a rapid evolution to produce high-speed, long-range mammoths of tremendous capacity, like the B-36. These huge craft can stay aloft for 10,000 miles as they streak through the express highways of the air, each carrying 10 tons of bombs. Research has already made low-girdling aircraft a reality. In 1949, a B-50, an enlarged, advanced model of the B-29, circled the globe without once touching wheels to Earth. Here, two B-29s demonstrate the technique of refueling in air that was used with such spectacular success. Our long-distance bombers 
will be given added protection by escorts of new long-range penetration fighters. Jet planes like the F-88 and the F-90 now under development. Some of our aeronautical wizards are even experimenting with a parasite fighter, the FX-85, that will be borne aloft in the belly of the giant bomber and nestle there until enemy aircraft appear. Then it will swoop away hawk-like to protect the mothership. The range and carrying capacity of the B-36 has been more than matched in its cargo-carrying cousin, the gargantuan C-99. Longer than the B-36, it can carry a load equal to that hauled by four railway freight cars. What is more, today's freighters of the skies need not come into land in order to unload their contents. Newly developed so-called monorail delivery systems make it possible for them to unload vast volumes of goods almost instantaneously by parachute. When cargo and troop carriers must be landed, pilots need not be deterred by the absence of prepared runways. This remarkable tracked landing gear makes it possible to alight on soft or uneven terrain. Every farmer's pasture is potentially an improvised landing field. And getting out is being made as easy as getting in. This C-47 made an emergency landing in this farmer's field. After repairs, it hops out neatly thanks to JATO, Jet Assist Takeoff, one of the most practical and successful products of recent engineering research. Runway length and takeoff time are cut at least a third. This jet bomber rises like a high-speed elevator. JATO plucks heavy Navy amphibians off ocean swells and sends them hurtling skyward. Or sends big planes skimming off the decks of carriers. And where the conventional plane cannot possibly go, regardless of technical ingenuity, the helicopter will do the job. The growth and size and versatility of the helicopter is illustrated by this McDonnell XH-10 which, besides its crew of three, can carry 10 passengers and boasts its own cargo lift. This progress in aerial accessibility must be matched by increased portability of arms and material to be moved by air. World War II saw the successful transfer of airborne troops with specialized equipment. Military science is aimed at the goal of air transportability for complete armies their equipment and supplies. To achieve this has been one of the major goals of research and development by the Department of Defense. A medium tank formerly was much too heavy to be moved by the ordinary cargo plane. Today, this lighter tank, stripped down, can easily be shuttled by air. This trend toward the smaller and lighter is important to global warfare in another way. Our military strategists foresee Arctic and subarctic areas as future theaters of conflict. Collapsible mobile huts hauled by tractors provide comfortable shelter for Arctic forces on the march. The extreme cold of these far corners of the earth magnifies the strain of physical exertion. At present, 75 to 90 percent of the snow soldier's time is given over to individual survival, leaving little time for military operations. Every additional ounce the soldier has to carry means a disproportionate decrease in operating efficiency. The clothes he wears are constantly being improved to be lighter and less cumbersome. These figures model recent designs. Ideal Arctic clothing will be impermeable to both snow and moisture and must be designed to retain body heat. Although field tests are made in nature's laboratory in Arctic and subarctic locations, it is in artificial weather chambers such as this that the most exacting and carefully controlled tests can be made. But to retain body heat, 
one must first generate it. No research project is being studied more exhaustively than that of Arctic rations. Food packages are not only being jammed with greater nourishment than ever, but are being redesigned for more compactness and less weight. Fundamental research is being conducted on the necessary nutrition requirements for operational rations and the prevention of deterioration through germ and chemical action. This study is one of many being conducted by more than 80 universities, technical schools, and government agencies, cooperating with over 500 industrial food organizations. In today's ultra-mechanized army, fuel for machines is as important to military engineers as food for soldiers. With a minimum operating temperature set by military standards lowered to minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit, it is necessary to develop fuels and lubricants that will not only prove satisfactory at extreme cold ranges, but will also allow equipment to operate at the surprisingly high temperatures of the Arctic summer. This urgent need calls for research into the basic nature of fuels and lubricants. From this study, we hope to learn not only how to keep these liquids constantly fluid at all temperatures, but also clues to better methods of making synthetic fuels, which may lead in turn to more powerful and cheaper propellants for jets and rockets. In projects such as this, the help of private industry is invaluable, thanks to its tremendous resources and know-how. On the other hand, Industry may well find in military research the clue to the basic mechanism of rust prevention. The vast quantities of arms and equipment now held in reserve by the armed forces demand the rapid improvement of rust-resistant processes. Although so-called mothballing with plastics has proved satisfactory for long-range storage, the need is pressing for something that will enable equipment to resist the deterioration of day-to-day -day use and the extreme wear and tear often demanded by military operations. The human machine is also under intense study to increase the stamina and resistance of the fighting man. As every war repeatedly proves, there is no mass weapon more effective than disease. Some of the greatest counter weapons military science helped develop were in the medical field, sulfur drugs, Penicillin, chloromycetin. While the manifold benefits of these germ killers are still being explored, military science has pursued studies in fields not ordinarily within the scope of civilian medicine. The effects of the atomic bomb are the most important and the most spectacular example. Among the first military personnel to enter Japan after VJ Day were medical scientists who rushed to Hiroshima and Nagasaki to observe the effects of atomic explosions on the survivors and render every possible assistance to their recovery. Carefully organized and exhaustively studied experiments were conducted as part of the bikini bomb tests to determine the effect of burns, concussion, and radioactivity on living beings. This research has led to the devising of different protective measures, such as salves and special clothing, which may prevent or reduce the injuries suffered by atomic blasts. There is no frontier of human knowledge left unexplored by the scouts of military research and development. From their trailblazing, there will emerge a more secure America, a nation as nearly invulnerable to aggression as a strong military establishment armed by unsurpassable technological superiority can make it. Only we must not rest on our laurels or allow ourselves to grow complacent. The price of liberty, a great patriot once said, is eternal vigilance. We must be watchful. We must be alert. We must be stronger than any potential foe. Not only on our frontiers of land, 
air, and sea, but also on our testing ranges and proving grounds, in our drafting rooms, and in our laboratories. Then we will preserve not only liberty, but peace and security as well.